That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Bubble, the seventh film directed by Judd Apatow, which is being released on Netflix April 1st, 2022, just in time for a big old April Fool's Day. <sighs> Other Judd Apatow movies are... Uh, well, he's, you know... Uh, with actually just six other films, he's quite the institution. Uh, but 40-Year-Old Vir Virgin was his debut. Uh, he did Knocked Up, uh, Funny People, um, This Is 40, Trainwreck. Uh, his last film was King of Staten Island, uh, which came out during the pandemic. And I thought while watching his latest, I'm like, I bet that this was heavily inspired by him having to uh, market... Uh, and talk about a film that opened, one of the first major studio films that opened uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. The basic story is, it's about the making of a film called Cliff Beasts 6, mm -hmm. which we're told is like the 23rd most popular like action franchise ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I thought was funny. And all of the actors coming back to this like production bubble they're somewhere in like the UK. Yeah, they're uh, right outside of London, uh, a place called Clifton House. So they're in like this big castle with these enormous grounds and they're all there to quarantine while they shoot this film. And the film is basically like all the shenanigans these actors get into and all of their complaints because they can't do what they want to do. A couple of the actors end up leaving because they're unhappy with the production. Ultimately, the remaining actors abandon ship, so we see we the filming takes way longer than it's supposed to. We're told it's a 90-day shoot, and they're there for like almost a year, I think. It's like something crazy, like 10 months. or mm -hmm. So we see, uh, we, f we flash forward two years and see that there is a documentary that has been made about the filming of this film within a film. And that documentary is very popular. Mm -hmm. The end. Yeah, okay. There you go. Uh, at, <laughs> I feel like this review is going to be long because there is a lot going on. At two hours and six minutes, it's a bit long for a comedy and feels very much like how Netflix allows its uh, collaborators to kind of run amok, uh, if you will. Because I think this would have been a really strong film at... Uh, a, a brisk 90 minutes because there's a lot here that I did enjoy and I did laugh at but there's a lot of dead space too I thought it felt like it was 45 minutes too long yeah I, I, I agree I think uh, some editing because uh, again I think <laughs> there's so much dead space at times we're thinking about how each kind of tangential sequence could have been punched up quite a bit there's, there's a lot of room for improvement <laughs> it feels like I'm just going to go through my notes so I thought this Felt like if Christopher Guest directed Tropic Thunder, but it's not as funny as any Christopher Guest movie. I agree, and he already did a movie about making a movie of a movie called For Your Consideration. Um, but and I don't, I'm not really a fan of Tropic Thunder. Uh, what there are a bunch of other films about making films during the pandemic. Uh, this reminded me of a film co-directed by Miguel Gomez, this notable Portuguese director, uh, called The Segua Diaries, which is August spelled backwards. Oh. Um, that I saw at Cannes last year that had a lot of uh, kind of similarities about people leaving the sets and breaking quarantine and putting their uh, co-stars at risk. Um, it also, based on how uh, Apatow was going in, and this was co-written by Pam Brady, who is a producer on South Park. Uh, she also created Lady Dynamite uh, with Maria Bamford, who makes an appearance uh, in this film. It reminded me a bit of uh, Fastbender's Beware of a Holy Whore, which is a, a very notable film about the making of a film based on uh, the trials and tribulations he had making a film called Whitey. And to me, this fe feels very much like Apatow's response to having to go through some things as a filmmaker. There is... So, there's so many characters. The main character is this redhead lady. What's her name? Karen Gillan, who you know from... Oh God, she's the, in the Guardians of the Galaxy films, oh. uh, Jumanji. Um, she's got an interesting film coming out soon, by directed by Riley Stearns, called Duel, which I didn't love, but is worth the watch. We sort of fo focus on her character. She's the first one to we see go on set, enter the bubble, and then we get um, a montage of her two weeks in quarantine, which I thought was kind of funny. Carol Cobb, and her other subplot is she's 
uh, her fiance, who has two children from another marriage and is kind of uh, mentally unstable, uh, has left behind, and there are a couple visits to. Uh, well, let's go through each okay. character. So there's her. That's her backstory with the boyfriend, the two kids, and he's just a gold digger. And she finds out that he has started seeing another woman while he's living in her house and not paying any bills. So she's upset about that and wants to leave. Then we have Leslie Mann and David Duchovny. They are also stars in the film. They used to be a couple. Now they're separated, but they adopted a 16 year old recently <laughs> who hates them. Because he sees how they really are. And notably, Leslie Mann, of course, is Judd Apatow's wife. Oh, sure. Who's been in almost all of his films. And her character is... She leaves set early because she gets her hand blown off. <laughs> Trying to escape. <laughs> Trying to escape. Then David Duchovny... I'm laughing because there are funny moments. Mm -hmm. David Duchovny is acting like he... He keeps trying to rewrite the script. Fred Armisen plays the director who starts off being sort of like meek and mild-mannered, can't take control. Darren but, Egan. Darren Egan is his name. But as filming goes on, he becomes more assertive because he's just tired of all their shit. Then we have a gentleman. He's the first one to walk off. What's his character's name? Howie. H Howie. Played by Goose Khan. I, oh, that's not who I said I liked. Oh. I like the guy who played was the hotel staff member, but Goose Khan... He's the first one to walk off. I actually liked him the most of all the actors in the film. Sure. Like in the film being made in the film. But then he's the first one to leave. He literally just walks off. Then we have a girl who I didn't know is Judd Apatow's daughter. Iris Apatow. Yeah. She just plays like someone who's very popular on TikTok and that's why she's cast. Crystal Chris. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she has anything to do. And TikTok has... I mean, TikTok's like probably the main character in this movie. Because we get a lot of video TikTok videos and mention of TikTok. Um, so she's there. And then the stunt choreographer's daughter is on set. Mm -hmm. This sort of like emo looking girl with bleach blonde hair who has attached herself to Apatow's daughter. Mm -hmm. They don't have much to do. The main joke for them is that she's the youngest one. Yeah, there's... I a, mean, there's nothing for her to do. There's a lot of talk about uh, the rift between millennials and Gen Z, which also came up in King of Staten Island. Okay, then we have the hotel staff members. So, the one guy you're did... For, you're forgetting Pedro Pascal. Pedro Pascal. As Dieter. Oh, that's right. He's supposed to be, like, the actor. He reminds me of, like, uh... What's his name? Uh, Robert Downey Jr. in Thunder... Tropic Thunder. Sure. Okay. Uh, Keegan Michael Key is Sean Knox. Oh, see, I didn't. He's in it. He doesn't have much to do except he's like, he's became notable aside from being an actor because he wrote some like self help book that has now turned into a cult. And this book he wrote is like a bible for these people. But then we find out in the end that not only did he not write that book, someone's like a ghostwriter wrote it, but he's never read the book, so he doesn't. Like, okay, whatever. And then, of course, probably the, the linchpin of that entire film crew is the producer, played by Peter Serafinowicz, uh, Gavin. Ugh, so much going on. There's okay. a lot going on, yeah. Then there are three hotel staff members mm -hmm. who are sort of integral. One, Bolo, is that his mm -hmm. name? He's t We're told that he does everything, like fitness trainer, uh, masseuse, he g general errands, whatever. Then there's the girl from Borat 2. Uh... Annika, played by Maria Bakalova. And her main thing is that she's in love with Dieter, mm -hmm. but she's like a virgin. So she keeps saying, like, once you're ready to, like, honor me by asking for my hand in marriage, mm -hmm. I'll be with you. And, of course, in the end, they both realize that they're in love and they're together. And then the guy I really did like, the one who seemed kind of gay... Who said his brother invented a hand that's supposed to help you pleasure yourself anally. Oh, that's right. And that was called um, Sanitary Ecstasy. Yes. Yes. Okay. I like. Okay. So then we have these three characters. So okay, what did I not like about this movie? One of the characters towards the end says, "No one wants to hear celebrities complaining," and that's how I felt for the entire running time. It's like it's really boring watching these like celebrities within a movie complain about the ultra luxurious accommodations they have to endure <laughs> to get this big paycheck to make a movie. It just gets kind of tired after a while. And I thought what would have been better is if we focused on the essential workers, like these staff members who have to deal with these stupid people mm -hmm. and sort of how they, like that would have been the better story to me. 
Because it did get old listening, especially the redhead lady complaining. Karen, Karen Gillan. The thing is that there, she she is written as kind of one note. That character never has a breakthrough in her agency. She's very passive and acted upon all the time as, you know, kind of being tossed around by, kind of reminding me of uh, Sarma Melangalis from Bad Vegan. Bad She's Vegan. Like, Everything happens to me and I have no agency. Well, and then she has a sub subplot of like having an affair with this very handsome soccer player who's also staying in the hotel, which that's like at the halfway point. And as the audience, I didn't even realize other people were in this hotel. Mm -hmm. And then there's an entire soccer team staying there. And then this one guy has an affair with her. And then we find out that he's married with many children. But his wife is okay with him having sex with other women. And that sort of blows her bubble. I think that, yeah, I think the problem is none of, unlike maybe a Christopher Guest films, none of these characters really get to have a moment they're all kind of players in this broken system uh, again which which does get old and I yeah the, I think like case in point the Duchovny Leslie Mann and I, I really do like Leslie Mann um, but the, this thing with they have with the kid that they adopted would have been much more funny if it's somebody uh, maybe the kid spoke Spanish and they couldn't understand him and so he's saying all these terrible things to him and they're like mm-hmm okay whatever that it, it just seems like there things weren't twisted enough. I agree. To be um, interesting. <laughs> there are a lot of cameos. I have a Maria Bamford plays the TikTok girl's mom, mm -hmm. which is a cute scene. And I always like seeing Maria Bamford. Yeah. I think the best cameo is John Cena. Yes, that is, is the, best the stunt cameo. coordinator, but he can't be on set, so they have him. <laughs> they have him like on Zoom on an iPad on a stick, and he's watching everyone and telling them how to do this choreography but then the person holding the stick is doing interpretive yeah it's not like asl it's like he's doing interpretive dance to mm -hmm. what john cena is saying that was definitely a, high, a comedic highlight then we keep getting kate so the producer what's his name that actor gavin or gavin okay so he reports to kate mckinnon and the joke is that because we're in quarantine Somehow she's able to be in like this luxurious, like an Aspen somewhere skiing. She's the studio head at Paula. Mm -hmm. And he's explaining to her like as, as the production time runs long and she like he's concerned and she's like, I don't care what you have to do to get this movie made, but you're getting it made or I'm like, you're done. And then at a point he tells her this is not going to happen. And she threatens him and then she hangs up and then she calls her boss played by John Lithgow. John Lithgow. And he does the same thing to her like, oh, I don't care what you do, the movie's getting made. And then he hangs up with her in a panic and calls his boss, who is this Chinese man. So we're supposed to understand that, like, you know, it's funded by Chinese money. And he explains the same thing to him. And they recognize from their Zoom backgrounds. They're both on Fiji. They're both on the island of Fiji and they go play tennis. I thought that whole, that entire thing with Kate McKinnon and then that gag felt like extra. It did, again, it didn't pop well enough, but I did like many of the conversations with Kate McKinnon, who secretly mm. hires this troop of men, this, this, these security people that violently keep everybody in line. Um, she reminded, I, I thought she was trying to caricaturize um, Amy Pascal from Paramount. Oh. Is, is what I thought they were going for with that. Um, Dieter's character, his sort of uh, plot line is that he needs sex. Like, clearly he's a very sexual person, and now that he's in this bubble, he can't find anyone. So we see him ask several people, man and woman, if they will have sex with him, and everyone says no. Which is kind of odd, because he is a very attractive man. So I thought that was a weird thing that, like, no one took him up. They make it look like he can't take care of himself, though. If you, sure. If you look at his wardrobe and how his hair is done, he's supposed to be kind of but sh schlubby, I guess. But there's a scene where he has, you know, those, like, workout mirrors where there's, like, a trainer, like, a like a mirror, a, a floor-length mirror with, like, the trainer embedded, and he ends up having, like, a moment, because he's on drugs, where he has sex with the person in the mirror. Which is played by... Daisy Ridley. Which was weird because at the end of the film, when they're all at the premiere of this documentary, Daisy Ridley is on the red carpet with him. Yes, I think that was supposed to be... It felt like, I don't know if it's supposed to be meta, I don't know. It, I thought it was kind of stupid. There's also scenes with Beck uh, and James McAvoy. That's right. And you know I love James McAvoy. He didn't have anything to do. Oh, my favorite auxiliary staff member was the guy playing Gunter. Uh, yes, the COVID crisis officer, uh, Henry Trevaldwin, who's making his debut. 
He, I really liked him. He was very funny. Yeah. Yes. He, um, he has a great look. Uh, he's very thin. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed him. And apparently he's like a, you said debut? Yeah. I yeah. Think. So good for him. Cause I think he's like a natural on screen. Um, so part of the filming of this movie, Cliff Beasts 6, is there a lot of dinosaurs and we get a lot of, um, scenes with like action with the dinosaurs. And I thought they looked really good. Mm-hmm. They did look good. <laughs> they... I just wish that the film within a film had felt... You, like, David Duchovny's trying to write, it, to write it with this progressive, environmentally friendly message, which is kind of ridiculous because they're dinosaurs uh, that need to be killed. Uh, but I almost wish that there was something in that production that was a little more subversive that they were, was trying to be said. Uh, well, that's why I think it would have been better to focus on the staff and how they are subjected and maybe they do all these really sort of weird, dark things. And yeah, uh, well, but positively, another, I, I think a really good scene was because the redhead is trying to rile everyone up to walk off set. Mm-hmm. And they're not interested in leaving the f- production. But they're all high on cocaine, I believe. That's the best scene in the film. Actually. And they're all high on cocaine in this room talking about like the production and how they should leave or should stay. And... All of their faces morph into other people. That is, like Gunter turns into Benedict Cumberbatch. And mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought that was a really good that scene. That was, in a, reading the press notes, that was kind of an off-the-cuff scene uh, suggested by Peter Serafinowicz. But, uh, Another funny moment is that the, the very end of the film, I think it's actually the end credits, on the red carpet of this documentary, a reporter is interviewing Gunter, the COVID crisis representative. And he says, you know... I took all these COVID swabs, but I didn't know where to send them. So I never actually tested it. So I still have them. So I still have them if anyone wants them. <laughs> Again, I like this concept. It's, it's very Boonwellian, right? This this group of people that can't ever really get anywhere. Kind of like, you know, exterminating angel. They can't leave. Or um, discreet charm of the bourgeoisie is they can't ever seem to get where they're, what they need to complete i think another good scene is entertainment weekly is interviewing the cast and Brett armison's like yeah the the shooting is going so well we're gonna roll right into cliff b7 yeah (laughs) karen gillen loses she loses her shit (laughs) my overall thought is the movie's too long it is i got bored at moments but there are enough chuckles that i would since it's on netflix like go ahead and put it on and you can probably like clean house do dishes cook dinner while you watch it um i think iris apatow is kind of cute and she does get to do really she did, She gets oh. to do a couple TikTok moments, which again... I'm surprised you think that's cute. I thought that... Well, maybe I just like the soundtrack because that had a Doja Cat song. I, I think it. you like the Doja Cat song. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but uh, the, who's retiring, I guess. What What's happening? Uh, but again, I think that's not going to age well. And I, I th- Oh, that's what I was going to say. It's too timely. Like COVID, COVID protocols, and then tiktok being so heavily featured i feel like 20 years from now this is not going to feel nostalgic it's going to feel lame it's going to be like when we when films that were trying very hard to be enmeshed in the swinging 60s that now play that that are very dry and silly it might play like that again i think this is smarter than that uh it just... Mm. I could be done. Do you have any other things you want to say? It was shot by Ben Smithard, who was the uh, director of photography on The Father, which I thought was interesting. I really, really liked. Shout out to Olivia Coleman and Sir Anthony Hopkins. Mm-hmm. And the other Olivia. She was she was good. I don't know her name. What's her name? Uh, I'm, you don't know either. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'll flash her picture, though. I forget. From, uh, uh, from Rushmore. Uh, Olivia... And I like oh, that's her. right. I called them Olivia Squared. Mm-hmm. Anyway. We'll put her picture up. What would you give this movie? Uh, three out of five. It's entertaining. <sighs> enough. I would give it two and a half out of five, but okay. it is entertaining enough. Anything else? No. Bye. Bye.